Street Circle. Okay. okay. Good luck. Oh, only the name I understood from that, that discussion. Yeah, so I was talking about you. <laughs> uh, hopefully it's fine. Um, yeah, so thank, thanks so much, everyone, for, uh, for the time and the opportunity. I got uh, a little bit of an understanding of, of this group. Uh, very, very interesting, very eclectic uh, background. So I appreciate the time to, to be able to spend with you this afternoon. So I, uh, I've been in security for a very long time, as I'm sure many of you have as well. Uh, just out of curiosity, did anybody go to the RSA conference last week? Any, any attendees here? No, no, anyone? So, um, so I've been uh, the chairman of that conference for... Uh, I think 10 years now, and we just had uh, over 40,000 people show up in San Francisco for it, which is, I, I think, an incredible testament to our industry, right, that we've grown to this place that we can launch a denial of service attack on a city like San Francisco successfully, <laughs> successfully, right? Now, all the hotel rooms were gone. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the trends that came from that event, uh, but also really just want to spend some time on this concept that I think probably everyone in here is fairly familiar with. It's the, the first one you learn on day one in security, right, this idea of defense in depth. Uh, but I think that our notion about what defense in depth is is changing. It's changing because people are more mobile than they have been before. You heard from the previous presentation about the move to cloud and workloads into the cloud. So there's starting to be a very different view, uh, not destroying our concept of defense in depth, but augmenting it in a world where things are truly mobile. So we'd love to spend a little while on that. Uh, but before I get there, I just want to share a, a personal security story with you to, to set the scene for, for what I think some of the biggest problems are. Uh, I travel uh, pretty often. I think uh, last year and the year before that, I flew 500,000 miles, which I do not recommend, by the way. It's not, nobody wins. Nobody wins in that scenario. Uh, but when you fly that much, you just see statistically very strange things on planes. And, um, and so I, you know, I, I take these long haul trips very often. And four years ago, I was on a flight from San Francisco to London, one I'd taken many, many times. You know, it's about a 10 hour flight. And I have a very sad pattern. I have my iPad. It's loaded with episodes of the Big Bang Theory. I don't know if anybody's seen that. If you haven't seen it, you have to see it. It's amazing, amazing, amazing show. Uh, so I've got my episodes, I'm ready to go. The plane takes off. We're maybe 10 minutes into the flight, so we're in the air, you know, probably five minutes into my episode, and then I hear screaming from the left side of the plane, right? which is, for those of you who don't fly very often, very unsettling. Right. And, and, so, and so then I see an object pass by the left side of my head, hit this lady who was two rows in front of me in the back of her head, drop to the ground and take back off. Right? And everybody's panicked. Nobody knows what's going on. And the captain comes very calmly over the, over the, the loudspeaker and says, oh, folks, I, I hope you're having a good trip. Um, you know, you may, uh, you may have noticed, but we have an extra passenger on board today. There is a bird trapped in the cabin of the plane. But not to worry, we have a zoologist on staff. But now think about that, that is actually very worrying that this happens enough that there's a, that's very, so it's actually very worrying. But anyway, so not to worry, we have a zoologist. We have been in contact with the zoologist. He's formulating a plan. Please stand by. Right. So meanwhile, the bird is terrorizing this plane. And, you know, I won't get into a lot of details. I know it just had snacks uh, outside, but apparently the bird also had a full meal before the flight. I'll leave. I'll leave it at that, uh, which made it a little, uh, a little more unpleasant even than normal. And, uh, and then in those kinds of panic situations, you always get wisdom of the crowd. 
right? People that have suggestions of, of what to do. And someone, you know, yells out that we should have the air marshal shoot it, right? That was the first. <laughs> and that, you know, it was, uh, it, was, it was popular for a few seconds. And then, you know, once the implication kind of sat in, that, that went away. And then someone else suggested we should roll a window down and the... Uh, <laughs> bird will fly out, you know, all, 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 also not, not popular on consideration. And then finally, the pilot comes back and says, okay, we've got a plan, and the plan is we are going to close all the shades inside of the aircraft, so it's dark in the cabin. We're going to open the bathroom, so open the lavatories. The bird will be attracted to the light, and then we're going to trap the bird, right? And it sounded much better than the other plans proposed, so... <laughs> So everybody did it, right? We complied very quickly. And amazingly, it worked. Five minutes later, the bird flies into the bathroom in business class when it really kind of hits home uh, and strikes personally. Uh, but, you know, launches a denial of bathroom attack for the rest of the, or re rest of the trip. They tape it up and we continue on to London. And so now it's, it's 10 hours later, We've landed, and it's, you know, it sounds funny now, but it was actually incredibly traumatic at the time. So as soon as we landed, I called my wife in the U.S., woke her up, middle of the night, and, you know, I told her the full story. The bird, the air marshal, the, you know, the whole, the, the whole thing. And her immediate first reaction when I told her this story was, is the bird okay? okay. <laughs> did, did... Did the bird survive, right? And I said, you know, I, I, I don't know. At a minimum, it's very unhappy, but I don't know. I don't know if it made it. So about uh, two hours after that, I met with a, a security professional, you know, someone like us that's been in the industry for a long time, and he worked for me, and, you know, still traumatized by this bird incident. I told him the same story, same detail, same cadence that I told my wife, and his immediate first reaction, w w without even thinking about it, was, huh, I bet I could build a small mechanical drone bird that has an explosive charge, <laughs> have it fly into the plane while they're loading food, and if they couldn't find a wild animal, how would they ever find my drone exploding bird, right? So I look at the guy, and, you know, first I'm like, hey, first it's very concerning that to me that you uh, would think that. Um, but, but then I confess to him, that's the first thing I thought about too. As soon as I saw that bird, the first thought that ran through my mind is there is a vulnerability in this system. There is a weakness that exists here that allowed this bird to enter that plane. That's the first thing I thought about, the only thing I could think about uh, for the rest of that trip. And it's very interesting, you know, I've told uh, this story now as part of my therapy for it, uh, <laughs> probably, you know, pr probably uh, several hundred times. And it's amazing. Everybody that I've told it to always falls into one of those two groups. Either, either it's, you know, was the bird okay? Did it make it? You know, was it safe? What are the domestic import policies for birds for the United Kingdom? Like, stuff like that. Or it's folks that see it for what it is, which is the exposition of a risk. And two sets of people with the same set of facts have those very different reactions. And so you have to, to start to wonder, how would those two types of people look at something like this? Right? So a, a pop-up shows up on the window. It asks you a question. And if my wife looked at this, her immediate thought would be, what do I need to click to make it go away? Right? That's her algorithm. It's repeatable. It can, you know, it, it works. It'll get her to whatever web page she needs to get to. If, if one of us, who's lived and breathed this stuff for a long time, looks at this, you start to get really worried. You ask, what site did I just go to? What network am I connected to? You know, what DNS is that thing using? You, you run through a series of questions in your mind about risk. But what we have done, I think, in the technology space 
is set people up to fail from a security perspective. We are asking people to make security choices that they are in no way equipped to make. And a great example of this is anybody here that has an Android phone. When you download an application for that phone, it asks you, do you want this thing to have access to your location? Do you want this thing to have access to your camera? Do you want it to have access to the security logs? My mom is not in a position to answer that question. Right? All she can think about is, I really want to shoot this bird towards these pigs, and whatever this app is going to ask me for, I'm going to accept. Right? So we have set people up in a way that we know they will fail from a risk choice perspective. It's, it's very similar to putting the Parmesan cheese next to the industrial strength cleaner at the dinner table. Right? Every, Everything might be fine right now, but at some point, somebody's going to the hospital because it's very easy to make a mistake. And I bring this up because I think that many of the problems we're struggling with right now in security come down to this exact issue. The issue of individuals who are employees inside of the company making choices every day, little choices, not big choices, that are putting companies at risk. And I don't think it's a problem that will ever go away. So it's, it's interesting when you start to sort of get your head around accepting that because you start to think about security in a, in a very different way, I think. And you start to think about the interaction between the user and a place that the user may be visiting. So for a long time, we've tried to protect information and users by protecting something, like protecting the device, for example, that they're on. Maybe we install antivirus on the device, and that's our kind of strategy for protecting the user against a threat. Maybe we put something in the network, and that network thing is protecting the user against a threat. Um, but we live in this period where more and more of those choices are being made by people every single day, especially as we move more technology off to the cloud. Because in the cloud, a user often has the ability to take something, even a document that's very sensitive, and share it with others in a way that we may not even have visibility into. I know you had a discussion uh, earlier on, on CASB and some of the challenges uh, in that space, but I think what it's going to boil down to again and again is user choice. Now the interesting thing about this though is there is a concept that exists that predates technology. It, 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 it goes back um, you know, probably uh, thousands of years now. It's this idea of a proxy. Not a network proxy, so don't, don't think about the way that you know, we typically think about proxies. Think about this idea of a proxy being someone who acts on your behalf that has some set of expertise. So think about proxies in our normal life. You know, usually we appoint, say, a lawyer as a proxy for us. They make decisions on our behalf and they, in a way, enrich our decisions with a set of expertise, right? So they are experts that are making a choice on our behalf. Doctors are often proxies for us. When you go under anesthesia and you're about to have surgery, that doctor is proxying a set of choices on your behalf, and typically you sign a document saying that he is going to make his best judgment during that period of time. So we're in a place where I think more and more we need some intermediate point that goes in between the user and the thing they are interacting with that is truly extensible, that we can add new types of expertise to when that expertise is needed. Sometimes we need, in our own lives, medical expertise. Sometimes we need legal expertise. Sometimes we need technical expertise. I think there is a, a, an influx of new ideas that are coming into the security space, but we need a gate in between the user 
and the thing that the user is interacting with to bring that technology to bear. And so this gets me back to how we classically think about defense in depth, right? So when we think about defense in depth, in technology, we think usually about this classic model of IT setup. And it is, there is some kind of headquarter office that has some data center, you know, maybe there's several of them. And then we have some sort of branch office that has usually an MPLS connection to the main office and then all internet traffic branches off from that headquarter office. And there's some sort of security stack in between those users and the rest of the internet. And in that environment, it's of defense in depth hold. So these are the properties of defense in depth that exist whether you're trying to secure a network, you're trying to secure a castle, you're trying to secure anything. So I was a uh, professor at Columbia University for many years and of course, you know, again, one of the first things that you teach is defense in depth and whenever you've seen it, usually people show a picture of a castle, right? And I'm so sick of seeing castles, I did not put a castle inside of this presentation. But the way it's typically described is that, look, I'm going to put a moat around the building and then I'm going to put a high wall and it's unlikely that the super swimmer that can get through the moat and the dragon that might be in the moat or whatever else is in the moat uh, has that same skill set to be able to scale the wall, right? It's two different sets of skills that an attacker would have to use to get past, and so it's defense in depth, which means there are two layers, or in some cases many, many layers, and those layers have to be diverse. That's, that's two critical properties of defense in depth. Multiple layers and diversity in layers. And then uh, the third one, which is the one in the middle here, is that it has to be applied around the entire castle, as opposed to just in the front of the castle. And you know, you can kind of just go around the back and there's no moat, there's no dragon, there's no wall. So we have to have consistency of application. Those properties were true a thousand years ago. They're true today. They're going to be true a thousand years from now. They're invariant. But I think that now we are adding and augmenting a set of things in addition to these properties for defense and depth. And why, why is this changing? Well, I think we're going through this period very, very quickly, quick, more, more quickly than any of us would have anticipated even four or five years ago, where applications that used to sit inside the data center are now being liberated off into the cloud. And it's happening at a pace that none of us can control. It's got to be an incredibly frustrating time if you are a CIO at a company because you used to have a huge amount of power, right? You could choose what, hey, we're gonna buy SharePoint, right? And we're gonna install SharePoint, and everybody's gonna use SharePoint, and yeah, I'm a little worried about security, so I'm gonna make people authenticate three times and give a blood sample before they can get into, into SharePoint server. Today, he can still require the blood sample, right? That's his, that's his right. Uh, but what will happen quickly is that a bunch of people, probably five or six people, around a table, in an office, in a meeting, will say, hey look, you guys all have Dropbox accounts, right? Every, yeah, yeah, I've got Dropbox, I've got Dropbox. And then one person will download the file and do the blood sample and get it from SharePoint once. And then the rest of that group will just micro-standardize on Dropbox. And why? Because it's convenient. People can always tell an increase in convenience, but it's almost impossible for people to tell an increase in risk. And I think for that reason, we're moving to a time where the true innovation in security comes at the nexus of usability and security. So if we can't increase or at least leave neutral the usability of a system, by augmenting it with security, the security will be nullified. That's, that, 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 that's a personal belief. So let's look at, at what's changed in that classical picture. First, 
the user's been liberated from the office. We know this. This has happened for many years now. Uh, people are bringing their own devices. They're working from Starbucks. They're outside of the classic, um, classic protections. The second thing that's happened is the applications are moving out one by one. Right? They've been moving out for the last several years. There's only a few left for some of us and some companies. Uh, but I think one of the most significant moves has been the move to Office 365. So for those of you in the audience that have had your organization move from an on-premise exchange server, for example, up to Office 365, it can be slightly painful while that process is happening, but then it's like really cool because now you don't have limits anymore. You, you know, you, before maybe you only had a 25 meg limit on the file that you could send to somebody, and now you could send somebody a 200 meg PowerPoint file just for fun. But if you look at the life of that file and where it's traveling, Instead of traveling, you know, sitting right next to somebody inside of an office, instead of traveling inside the network to the exchange server and then to that person, it's actually going out through the internet egress, out to a server that's in the cloud, and then it's coming right back down again. So now you've just passed 200 megs through the internet egress pipe just to move something from one person to another. That has some very strange implications when it comes to both the size of the pipe that a company needs and then the things that are needed to protect that pipe. The other thing that's interesting is the infrastructure has moved out very, very quickly. You know, okay, go, 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 yes. If, if, if they keep it in the cloud and work on it in PowerPoint in the cloud, that's true. For, for, me, for me personally, I can't get my head around it. I have to have that file on my desktop downloaded from that thing or else I freak out. I don't, may, maybe it's still PTSD from the bird incident that makes me, <laughs> that makes me do those kinds of things. But if you do keep it in the cloud, then I agree with you. You've got that file, it's still, you know, somebody uploads it one time and then it's out there in the cloud and you're basically having a browser window that just looks at that file and, and messes with it. So I completely agree with you in some cases and in the case of Google Docs, almost dominantly that's exactly what happens. But fundamentally, the file has left the building. Right? So the file is now not sitting on an on-premise site. It's now sitting on a place external from where you are. And, and, and that can be good or bad. Right? The good thing about it is Microsoft, Google, all of these places have huge security teams. Right? So it's not like they don't have any security people and this is very dangerous. Um, but it is very different when you start to think about defense in depth. The other thing that's happened very quickly, again, faster than, than you know, I think anybody would have anticipated, is the massive rise in SSL as a default. It's, a, it's almost becoming the transport layer for the web. Right? And it's happened quick. If you went back two years ago, or maybe two and a half years ago, pre-Edward Snowden, and you looked at the top 10, right, the top 10 sites that, that people visit around the world, two of those 10 were SSL by default. So they would switch to HTTPS as soon as you visited the site. Today it's eight out of those 10, which is unbelievable. Now for the average user, this is an incredible plus, right, because my mom has not had to do anything extra. There's nothing that she's been asked to do but her connection has become more secure, which is pretty amazing. And it's a really great benefit for an individual that's at a coffee shop that now has a secure tunnel to a bank, to Google, to wherever they happen to be going. So there's a massive privacy benefit for the individual. But think about this from a corporate infrastructure and governance perspective. 
all of those security tools that you paid a bunch of money for that are sitting on the network looking for malware, scanning you through AV, doing all kinds of interesting IDS, IPS work, they're blind to the traffic that sits within those SSL tunnels. Now obviously there are things and strategies to kind of crack that thing open, but that is a massive, massive shift that's happened very quickly, faster than I think anybody could have, uh, could have anticipated. And I really do think it was accelerated pretty heavily by, by Snowden. And then the other thing that's happening is that the regional office is going rogue. People are figuring out that it's expensive to hold that MPLS connection between the two, and the regional office is breaking off directly to the net. And then the last piece, is that we're seeing a, a massive adoption of the Internet of Things. We're not even doing it consciously. It's just happening. From the watch that's connected directly to Salesforce so that you can see somebody from a prospect is nearby and so I should talk to them, uh, to the pencil that will be connected at some point. I'm not sure why, but somebody will connect it. Um, and, and that poses a, a great risk. So I'll give you an example. At, um, at RSA conference this year, we get about maybe 3,000 speaker submissions that come in every year. And then we whittle those down to you know, maybe 250 or so sessions that get presented at the conference. This year, 30% of the submitted sessions had IoT in the abstract. It's unbelievable. It's crazy. That, that doesn't necessarily mean that 30% of the world's security problems are IoT, but it does mean that there is a massive interest in IoT, and we're very early in the security maturity cycle of, of IoT, because most of those submissions are around hacking into stuff. And you, you wouldn't believe the stuff that we got this year. I mean, everything, for, I mean, of course, there's the token, like, 20 car hacking ones that, that come in now, and that's old news. And, but we had uh, three refrigerators, two washing machines, a shirt, which was really strange. For some reason, the shirt had electronics in it. Um, there was uh, two police drone ones, which is always entertaining, uh, probably highly illegal. Um, and so we're, we're in, this, in this era of IoT where people are demonstrating weakness, but we're not yet in the place where they're demonstrating some kind of cohesive solution uh, to the problem. So I, I bring up all of these changes because what we're seeing is uh, almost a coalescence that we are going to have to have some intermediate point that is consistent in between those devices. Now, what is that likely to, to be? So first, I want to share with you the word cloud, and there's the hacked police drone now, as we speak, hovering outside. So, uh, so I want to, I want to bring, uh, bring to your attention the, the word cloud, and we build this every year from submissions that come into RSA conference, and the words on here, I, I doubt, would be surprising to anybody in this audience, right? It's, it's what you'd expect if you had to just draw it from scratch. Words like data are big, cloud is big, mobile is big, cyber is big. We took security as a word out because then it like dominates all the other ones. Um, so none of these things are surprising, I, at least I don't think so. But what is kind of surprising is if you go back five years ago and look at the word cloud from five years ago, it looks totally different from this. And it's interesting to live in an industry where that happens. So my PhD is in statistics, right? And I can tell you the statistics conferences do not have the cool parties like the RSA conference. But also if you did a word cloud of the cool stuff that's going on in statistics, Today, and you compare it with the one from 10 years ago, it ain't changed very much, right? There's, there is not a lot of change and churn in that industry that we see right now. So what does that mean in, in terms of the changing of this idea of defense? And three properties that we talked about at the beginning will never change. Those are invariant. Those still exist. They will exist. They'll exist far into the future. 
But I think some additional ones that are going to be very interesting is first the pluggability of security architecture. How many people here lived through the deprecation of DES as an encryption standard? I'm just curious how many people lost sleep over that thing. Not, not too many. Good. Well, you're very, very lucky because um, when, uh, when it was announced that several key government agencies were no longer going to use DES, which was the data encryption standard that many things were, uh, were based on, and that we were going to move to this new thing called triple DES, which I guess is three times better than, uh, than normal DES, um, <laughs> it meant that many systems had to be completely rewritten because they never assumed that this unbelievable algorithm would at some point expire or not be as useful as it was in the past. And then two years after that, they got the word that, hey, that triple DES thing, probably get rid of that and move to this thing called AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, right? And uh, several years from now, there's going to be another one. And we're in the same problem with hashes, right? MD5 sounded really great at some point in time. And then SHA-1 looked pretty good. And SHA-256 looking okay right now, but uh, it, uh, it, it's not going to make it too long. We're actually in a hash crisis right now. We, 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 really, we, we, we really are. And uh, if, anybody, uh, if anybody is a math hobbyist, I would be happy to discuss this hash crisis with you, uh, with you afterwards. But I, I bring all of those things up to say that we have to anticipate a certain amount of change that's going to happen in the way we defend. And I think we're going to have to anticipate a certain amount of change that happens in the technologies that we bring in to defend. I think there are going to be very interesting companies, startups, ones that none of us have ever heard of, that are going to come up with innovative solutions that are good, that we want to be able to deploy, but if we don't have an architecture to deploy those things quickly, we are going to be uh, behind the curve. So I'll, I'll, I'll share with you um, uh, another story, and this one is from, uh, from RSA last year. So, you know, n no one here uh, uh, was at RSA this year, so this, this may not be uh, as interesting. But last year, we only, only had 33,000 people, right? So less than, less than the 40 uh, plus thousand, but still a lot of people. It is a very stressful week for me personally. Right, because all kinds of crazy emergencies occur during that week when you get that many people in one spot and many of them have a tendency to hack into stuff. Right? <laughs> so not a good idea, right? just in general. And so you know, I had an incredibly stressful um, Monday and Tuesday. I don't know if you remember, but uh, right around the time of RSA, there was a guy that hacked into a, a Boeing aircraft um, probably uh, five days before the conference and tweeted about it while he was in the air and then had all of his stuff confiscated. And so he called me that weekend and said, hey, um, you know, I'm sure you've read about this in the news. Uh, my RSA presentation was on that stuff that got confiscated. I mean, just crazy stuff. We had three different vendors that had gone with a sumo wrestler motif that year uh, and had brought in actual sumo wrestlers from Japan to be in the booth. One of them was smashing through some fake firewall and talking about, you know, firewalls are dead and all that stuff. Those, those, three, um, those three sumo wrestlers apparently, unfortunately, ended up at the same bar on Monday night and there was an altercation. And, and, and nobody wins in that situation. Let me just tell you from experience. So I only give you that background to say it was a very stressful week. So now it's, it's Wednesday of that week. So two days of the conference has passed. It's Wednesday morning. I wake up. I had a breakfast meeting at 7 o'clock. Okay. I had a breakfast meeting at 7 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I walk outside of the hotel and immediately get a massive nosebleed. 
Now, you know, many of you get nosebleeds regularly, so this doesn't sound like a big deal, but it's the first one I've ever had in my entire life. And if you've never had one, it is very traumatic to start hemorrhaging from your nose, right? I mean, just the concept of that is bad. So I, you know, I grab my nose, I go into the elevator, uh, I go back up to the room, and I call the people I was about to have breakfast with. This lady answers the phone, who I know very well, and um, you know, she worked for me. And uh, I, I told her, well, you know, look, you know, I got this nosebleed, I, I, I'm not going to be able to come. And then immediately she starts offering advice of what I should do for, for the nosebleed. She said, uh, the first thing you need to do is pinch your nose, right? And I'm like, you know, obviously I'm already pinching my nose, right? And, I to, and, then, uh, and then she says, no, pinch it harder than you've ever pinched anything in your life. Pinch it, pinch it till you lose feeling in your fingers, right? And I'm like, wow, this doesn't sound like a good idea. And then hold your head back for 10 minutes and the nosebleed will stop. And then I hear almost like a fight breaking out at the table and suddenly I'm on speakerphone in the middle of this crowded restaurant and the other guy that was at that meeting says, don't do that. <laughs> then immediately you need to go to the bathroom, stuff your nostrils with tissue and hold your head forward for 10 minutes and the bleeding will stop, right? So, uh, you know, thanks guys, really appreciate it. And, and as soon as I got off the phone, I realized these are two completely contradictory pieces of advice. And so I'm like, this is a medical issue, this is serious. Uh, so I immediately opened up my browser and went to Wikipedia. And, and if you, you know, which is the ultimate source of truth. So if you've never, um, if you've never read the Wikipedia nosebleed article, it's very long, but the summary is you're probably okay, but you might be dying. Right? That's the, that's, that's the, that's the summary. And it's very long, but that's ba in essence, that's what it says, right? And so, and so I'm like, wow, you know, I better, I better contact a doctor. So I, I pulled out my iPhone, and I realized that I had access to this service called Teladoc. Has any, any, anybody ever heard of this thing? It's unbelievable. It is a uh, remote medicine app and service where within 15 minutes you'll have a live video chat with a doctor. Right? I'm like, wow, this is great. So I fire this thing up, you know, press the button, they're like, the doctor will FaceTime you in 15 minutes. I'm like, wow, this is great. So as I'm waiting, I'm cruising around the Yahoo help forums, health forums, which is never a good idea uh, if you're not doing well. Uh, and I saw something in there, the blood pressure is a, is a key piece of this. And so I find an app on, um, on the Apple iStore that measures blood pressure. Uh, has anybody ever seen this or played around with this thing? Have you, see, have you tried it? Yeah, I tried it with an Android phone. Oh, with an Android phone. It's, it's, you know, I mean, the, just the concept of that being possible was pretty amazing. So I spent the $4.99, and the way that, the way that it works, uh, if you're really bored this weekend and want to try it, you, you put your finger in front of the camera, it shines a light uh, through, it looks at the pulsation uh, that comes back, and then you hold it up to your heart, the microphone, and it gives you a blood pressure reading, which, you know, who knows how accurate it is. Um, and so it came back, and it was, like, extremely high, which made probably it, you know, really actually much higher. And so then the doctor calls, I get on the video chat, I you know, hold the phone at odd angles so you can look at the nostrils, all that stuff. And, uh, and he says, you know, based on what I see, you're probably not dying, you know, you're, you're, you're probably fine. Now, now, the interesting thing about that to me is that I had no idea when I woke up that morning that my phone would turn into a medical diagnostic piece of equipment. I, I had no idea it could even do that. And it's, and it's amazing, I'm sure it's happened to many of you, 
your phone turns into now whatever you need it to be. Sometimes I need to be a GPS system. Sometimes I need it to actually be a phone. Sometimes I need it to go and email someone. But the reason it can turn into all of those things is not because of the innovation of Apple or the innovation of Google in the case of Android. It's the innovation of the millions of people that build apps on top of what is actually just an incredibly rich sensor. Right? So when you bet on any of those phones, you're betting on an amazing ecosystem of creativity. I, I bring this up because that is the time we are in right now in security. Many people in security are jaded. They think that there are no new ideas that happen anymore in our industry. I can tell you, I've been running a startup competition at the last uh, 11 years, and innovation is alive and well in our industry. There's some really cool stuff from completely unknown vendors that you've never heard of that are coming down the pike. I bring that up to say that we have to prepare that there will be new innovative solutions that come. We don't know which vendors they'll come from. We don't know what size of company they will be. But we have to set up an architecture that can onboard that technology. Uh, I'll skip this story. Uh, the closing keynote this year, I interviewed uh, this actor named uh, Sean Penn, who the... Um, uh, the Mexican uh, drug mafia is after. So in the interest of time, I won't uh, share my drill with the FBI on what to do if someone breaks out a gun uh, in a crowd of 10,000 people, but we can talk about it on drinks if you want to. But the central, the central point is that we do need to be able to set up an infrastructure to rapidly onboard tech, and that tech is going to come from who knows what. I don't think it's going to come from the biggest vendors in the space today. I think it's going to come from innovative startups. The second piece is we need to be able to deploy anywhere the user is. And that might be on-premise, that might be in the cloud, that might be in AWS, that might be in Azure. But when we're thinking about making security investments, I think we have to think about the portability of where those things are going to be deployed. The third one is we have to develop a competency in failure. We, we have to be competent in the act of failing in what we do, because we will fail. I, I don't care if you buy something from every security vendor that exists, somebody really wants to get into your organization, and they're highly skilled and highly funded, they will get in, no matter what. If that's the case, if we accept that, then why don't we spend the money on training people, processes, and the ability to recover from bad situations. We, we just don't invest the kind of money into that and that seems very reasonable at this time. And then the last piece is we need to be able to take action when threat intelligence is noisy. And you're here, you'll hear a lot in security about threat intelligence. This year, I think we had 1,900 vendors on the show floor at RSA. And every single one of them had the word threat and intelligence next to each other in their marketing material. Right? What does threat intelligence even really mean in terms of an everyday action that you're going to take? We are going to need to be able to make decisions on threat indicators, even when we don't know the fidelity of that information. So I'll, I'll leave you with the last thought. I know I'm painfully, uh, painfully out of time, and I know you've been here for quite a while, and I do not want to launch a denial of drinks attack on you. I found that that's very dangerous. It's very dangerous for all parties uh, involved. But I, I do believe that we're at a, a weird time in security where we have to relearn things that at one point were facts. And, and I personally, as I'm sure many of you are are, are, are culprits in the current state of affairs. So I've written four security books. The first one was back in 2003. And at that point, the world looked very similar to how it looked on that first slide where branch offices connect to a, to a corporate office and then a corporate office branches off. 
If I had to rewrite that book today, it would look really different. And I think if we had to revisit some of the core tenets of security, not just network security, but software security, the way that we build systems, the way that we couple systems, it would be different today because the environment around us has changed. And the closest analogy that, that I can think of to it is the way we all learned how to drive. So when you learned how to drive and you, you, you took the exam and you, you know, filled out the pieces of paper, we were all told to hold the steering wheel in the 10-2 position, right? This is the, and, and you do it for the test and then you never ever do it again, right? But, but this is how, how you were taught, taught to drive and, and it wasn't a random choice by some guy that wrote a, a manual the first time. It is the statistically calculated optimal hold of a steering wheel to give you the maximum agility in an unexpected situation. So if there's a cat that meanders into the street, if you're holding the wheel this way, this gives you and the cat the most likely um, survival kind of conditions uh, because it will allow you to pivot and not go hand over hand, which is apparently very dangerous. 10 to 20 years ago, this was the mathematically correct answer on how to hold a steering wheel. Today, you should never hold a steering wheel like this. You never hold a steering wheel like this. It's incredibly dangerous. The way to hold the steering wheel now, and the way that you'll see if you've got kids or nieces and nephews or grandkids that are learning how to drive, They'll tell you the way you hold the wheel is like this, in the 9-3 position. So what's changed is the popularization of airbags. If you hold the wheel in the 10-2 position and the airbag deploys, you're going to burn an arm, break an arm, or punch yourself in the face, right? All, all, all of which are, are not preferable outcomes. But if you hold the wheel in this position, it's a compromise between the change in environment that's occurred, the compensating controls in that environment, and agility. It's a compromise between those two things. Try telling someone who was taught to hold it the top way that that's wrong now, and they need to hold it a different way. Try telling my mom that. I will give you her cell phone number. I will even pay the long distance charges if you can convince her to change uh, the way she thinks about that. So my point there is it is incredibly difficult to unlearn a fact. It is very difficult to unlearn something that was once true and convince someone that it is no longer true and now there is a new truth. But that's where we find ourselves in security and many of the things that we do. So if there's anything to take away from this talk, aside from, you know, avoid birds on planes and now you know to use the bathroom and all that kind of stuff, uh, it, it, it would be that we need to sit back and really challenge convention and what, what is considered conventional wisdom uh, in this space. So I really appreciate you giving me the time and opportunity to be here. Uh, I hope many of you will come next year to uh, RSA conference. Not, not to shamelessly advertise it, but we did have Cheryl Crow this year at the party and Tony Hawk. So, you know, I'm not trying to influence you, but I am. Uh, but hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be there next year. And thanks very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks. 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 Thanks.